Thanks. Um, as you heard, I'm Dave Mosher. <laughs> yeah, clap. You can clap if you want. You don't have to. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, uh, the, the panelists here who are actually far more interesting than I am. Um, on the left here, you have Jennifer Lopez, who you've seen before, but I'll just reiterate her title. She's the Commercial Innovation Technology Lead for Cases. So everyone give her a round of applause. Thanks. Re round of applause if you've seen her before. And uh, directly to my left is Sean Casey, the Managing Director of the Silicon Valley Space Center. So these two people know a lot about the space business, and if you're looking to break in or get a little 411 on what's happening there, um, you know, you're in the right place. So I just want to start off, um, if you could each walk, walk us through in like a couple sentences, what, what is it that you do for a living? <laughs> no. Do you want to start? Okay. So, uh, and I don't know if you caught my presentation uh, from earlier this afternoon. Uh, as um, Dave mentioned, my official role is the Commercial Innovation Technology Lead for CASIS, or Center for the Advancement of Science in Space. And we were selected to manage the International Space Station U.S. National Laboratory in 2011. Essentially, I work uh, with, uh, along with my other commercial innovation colleagues, uh, directly with uh, technology Fortune 500 companies, other government agencies, academia, to bring new research and development, new innovations to the space station and to essentially uh, try to maximize the utilization of the platform for the benefit of our planet. That's the best way I can describe. <laughs> so, so the government basically asks you to make the best use of the space station and, and its research environment. Yes, okay. exactly. <laughs> I'll sum that up. Uh, Sean, so tell us about uh, what it is that you do. Yeah, sure. I'm uh, in Silicon Valley, so 3,000 miles away. But um, I spent 20 years working for, 20 plus years, uh, working with NASA on a variety of astrophysics program. I got my PhD in astrophysics from the University of Chicago, and then I'm also a graduate of the Columbia School of Business, primarily uh, for the growth of this, gro of this commercial space industry. Uh, I'm here in New York. I'm working with Sidney uh, Nakahodo, who is in some sense an entrepreneur, but um, Silicon Valley Space Center works with a variety of entrepreneurs in hardware, software, and wetware. We've supported CASIS uh, with events in Silicon Valley in 2013. We've also supported suborbital companies uh, in the development of uh, payloads and customers uh, for their businesses. We're working with uh, entrepreneurs at MIT, developing a company called Lunar Station to uh, provide er uh, lunar observations from low Earth orbit and from lunar orbit. So, uh, Silicon Valley Space Center works with early stage companies as impedance matching between scientists and engineers and the angel and venture capital community. So let's let's expand on that a little bit um, because you just you threw a lot at us there. That's a lot of activity. Um, tell us about what are these emerging areas that you're seeing? I mean, you're in Silicon Valley. You're looking for these opportunities and helping fuel those opportunities. Where where are they? What are they? What what is uh, what is rising in this industry? What is happening right well, now? Well, I I think. Um, there's been a lot of activity in uh, low Earth orbit. <clears throat> and so CASIS is a great example of that. Uh, many, many years ago, they decided, gee, how could we create a national lab in low Earth orbit? We've got national labs are all around the country here in New York. We've got uh, Brookhaven, which is a national lab. CASIS is a natural lab in low Earth orbit. Uh, we also have entrepreneurs that are building small payloads that can launch from the ISS, they can launch from uh, a number of companies that are coming online, uh, uh, SpaceX, uh, the, they can launch from the Russians, they can launch from the Indians. But uh, fundamentally what's happening is that the defense, um, aerospace is an industry where uh, it's unlikely to adopt new technologies. They're just risk averse. So uh, if you fly something in space, you'd like to have it as space heritage. And that means there are a lot of technologies which you know, perhaps sit in my pocket here, my cell phone, um, where an aerospace company would say, well, we've never really flown that in space. So, um, but any industry, any segment that has um, uh, lack of innovation is ripe for disruption by entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs, we have many of them in the audience here, but an entrepreneur will look at 
something and say, why not? Why is it that I can't take the cell phone that's in my pocket and fly it in low Earth orbit? And what does that, what does that look like? And so we've seen an explosion of uh, entrepreneurs having access to space and that access is augmenting and I would say disrupting existing space businesses. Yeah, and you brought some fun charts. I'm going to look at those in just a second. But uh, kick the question to Jennifer. I mean, what are those? What are those sort of risky areas uh, that everyone, the the big dogs, you know, the the long-term uh, huge companies have been avoiding? What what are those opportunity spaces? Those risk areas uh, in your mind? Uh, I would uh, tie that back to the work that we're doing, at least in the commercial innovation side, um, because we're interfacing pretty closely with a lot of the Fortune 500 companies that traditionally have never worked in space. Um, and so the inherently, you know, the, the approach is, you know, to be, you know, with, to, to uh, tackle it with some trepidation and, and um, of course, curiosity. But, but there's, you know, because there hasn't been any prior um, uh, work or at least re research and development in low Earth orbit, uh, it's, it's a lot of education and a, a lot of um, awareness really trying to show the the business case or the use case of why it's significant to at least attempt to, to try to do something in low earth orbit uh, and how th we can translate that back to their businesses or, or how to translate that back to what what's already happening on the ground I mean a lot of these companies are already spending billions of dollars on R&D anyway um, and so really trying to show them the, that uh, that comparison that you know how can we take what they're already spending uh, and and por uh, portion some of that for microgravity research or portion some of that for work in low Earth orbit but to really translate that back to, you know, wh what is the, the output or what, what could the impact potentially look like for them on the ground? Um, and of course, you know, so that's on, at least on the big dog, you know, the, the big Fortune 500 side. And then of course, because of what uh, uh, Sean was just talking about in terms of access, you know, that's also really driving a lot of the small to medium sized enterprises to really show, okay, and, and organizations like ours that can provide the gateway to, to get more opportunities. Um, of course, there's other things associated with that with, you know, um, timing, launch um, factors, or, you know, a lot of variables associated with that. But, you know, all of these things are getting better and we're, we're they're moving at least in, in the right direction. But hopefully that uh, answers a portion of the <laughs> yeah and uh, i would also say it's getting much cheaper to get up there and and do things as well with uh mm -hmm. the, the coming commercial providers and mm -hmm. you know they're increasing li reliability would you also agree with that statement oh yeah this is a race mm -hmm. to uh you know when we were flying the sh nasa's space shuttle uh the cost of uh um it was uh, uh let me, let me two thousand uh, two thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars per kilogram on the shuttle. Uh, today with SpaceX, it's about $2,000 uh, per kilogram. And so you've got orders of magnitude. You know, you've seen a factor of 10 reduction in the cost of access to space. And that has still more to go in coming down because we have a wide variety of other launch providers. Uh, the four billionaires uh, for uh, Allen, Musk, Branson, uh, Bezos are all focused on one issue, and that's reusability. And reusability, I just flew out, you know, God, I guess got off of, you know, I flew out from California, boy, are my arms tired. Uh, but uh, that being said, uh, the plane I flew out on is reusable, right? Nobody grinds the plane up and throws it away after it's on a coast to coast flight. Likewise, with, sub -or uh, with orbital flight, uh, you need reusability, and that's what uh, entrepreneurs are focused on. Yeah, it'd be uh, unfortunate to throw a plane away after every use, right? Yeah, um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have a business model. You wouldn't have United, you wouldn't have an American, you wouldn't have all these airlines. So we see there's a lot of opportunity here. We have lowering costs, we have a lot of activity going on in low Earth orbit. How do people in this room or you know, people who are listening in, how do they get involved? How do they, uh, for lack of a better term, hack into this industry? How do they become a part of it? What are these like entry points? What are the opportunity uh, spaces for that? Yeah, new space is all about lowering the barrier to entry to uh, uh, to space, and you know the, the way uh, I'm a child of Apollo, so you'd sit on your couch and you'd walk astronauts watching uh, walking on the moon. That's one level of space activity participation. But today, in the 21st century, it's really building and flying hardware, and you can do that at various different price points: at a thousand dollars, at ten thousand dollars, at a hundred thousand dollars, at a million dollars. And uh, what's happened is that access to space has fallen within the typical 
tranches of funding associated with the venture capital industry. So I don't need uh, you know, $200 million to demonstrate something. I can, or a billion dollars, you know, there's the uh, Dr. Evil, you know, only a billion dollars. A billion dollars. Right, yeah, only, uh, you know, I only need this much as, and entrepreneurs will say that, I only need $10 billion to make my company succeed. And that, of course, is not gonna go anywhere, but for, an, uh, for a startup, you'd like to say, okay, what can you do with $500,000? What then, demonstrate some success with customers. What can you do with uh, a couple of million dollars? And Cases has been a great uh, supporter of that model in providing, helping entrepreneurs in the on-ramp to space and per, uh, subsidizing costs and um, you know supporting, and Jennifer can talk about all the Cases activities. But it's, um, and you know, there are, and today for Space App, we have a whole wealth of satellite imaging data, which is coming down. And I just came back, we both came back from Space 2.0, which was focused on the value of satellite imaging. We had an Earth Pixel session. Um, and there's all this information, which is the raw images are fine, they're beautiful, but the question is what decisions can you make based on that data. And we live in a world where there's all these economies of scale for AI, for deep learning, for big data analysis, and all of that technology can be applied to the satellite imaging sector. So, so just to interrupt real quick, uh, and then I'd love to hear your answer to the previous question. It, it sounds like there's a lot of data. We're swimming in this data. The, que the question is, what do we do with it? On, on, the, on the data side, anyway, hardware is another issue. Um, so if I'm a farmer, you know, I own a lot of farmland, you know, maybe I could, how can I most efficiently use that data to water my crops or see where uh, it needs harvested, things like that. I guess if you could, both of you, just throw out a couple of examples, both on the hardware side, I'd love to know what are some really innovative things, or at least one innovative thing that you've seen that you, you just would like to throw out as an example of something that, um, you know, has really impressed you. Maybe it, w maybe it was sort of a grassroots thing or, or something that came out of left field. Um, that really just blew you away. What's an example of that? And, and on the data side, what, what are some, some really creative applications you've seen or reviewed lately? Does it have to be related to data in terms of the hardware? No, <laughs> no it doesn't. Okay. I, just the whole industry, let's just uh, pull back to that. Um, because I have a lot of examples in terms of hardware, but not, well, there's also ex examples in relation to, to remote sensing or uh, aerospace tech dev, but um, because I was, when you were talking about the Space 2.0 conference, I was talking about in-space manufacturing. Um, I was on a panel yesterday about that. Um, and that whole industry has just exploded, you know, tremendously. And to see how even startups, you know, began with, you know, tech demonstrations, uh, experimentation, and that has then led to, you know, fully, you know, formed a, a revenue generating business. Uh, those are some examples that I was, you know, thinking of in terms of success stories relating to hardware. Uh, but again, it was more so on the manufacturing well, even, side. Even Unless uh, if you have a specific. Yeah, I would even say like Earthcast. Yeah, Earthcast, Earthcast, is Earth, another, yeah, Earthcast got their start. Mm -hmm. They're a satellite imaging That's company. U R T H. Yeah, you you are the cast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so cast. so it's it's a funny. You can kind of pronounce their name several different ways. You are the cast. Earthcast. Oh, right. right. So. That's true. Um, uh, but they, uh, they're uh, an imaging company, and they got their start by building hardware and mounting it to the ISS, mm -hmm. demonstrating the success of that imaging technology, and today they've migrated that technology from what's attached to the ISS to free-flying satellites. And it's a combination not only of Earth imaging, which I think everybody understands, but also uh, what they call synthetic aperture radar. And there are a whole host of technologies that uh, NASA has developed, that people have flown in space, which really haven't had their, you know, their opportunity for prime time. They haven't fully become commercial technologies because I would say NASA's been interested on building the case for space. So that technologies have flown on the shuttle, technologies have flown on the ISS, but what usually happens is if you're a technologist, You'll get your time to fly in space, and then you're like, wow, this was really great. We had a great experience. We're ready for the next stage. And what will happen for the entrepreneur, the technologist, is they'll say, that's great, but you got to now get in the back of the line. <laughs> and there's a huge line of people that, uh, that want to fly stuff in space. So I think NASA's done a great job 
um, of, demo, of building the demand for space. Mm -hmm. And we saw mm -hmm. that at the Space 2.0 where mm -hmm. people were like, I used to fly stuff 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and we demonstrated the best <laughs> crystals ever and we never got a chance to fly again. Yes, Why that's is true. And so now is the opportunity to take those, te those technologies. Earth observations is not new. We've been doing this for, yeah. for 50 years, but yeah. it's the price point has come down and we've opened the floodgates for a wide variety of companies to fly new technologies mm -hmm. in space get their data, and make it available. And the key is turning the crank to monetize that data. How I have the images, what do those images mean? And I think the slides I have sort of speak to a little bit <laughs> about uh, that. While those are pulled up, I, I, show of hands, who has seen the video footage from Earthcast, you know, where it pans over a site and the buildings sort of move? If you haven't seen this yet, you need to. It's really incredible. Um, there was an instance where they took a video of a North Korean palace and you could see the shadows of the guards walking around the monument. Um, so, it's the, I, I, so I guess this is a, my way of saying the other thing that has happened in the intervening years, uh, even though it's not uh, new per se, r remote sensing, is that the technology has gotten so much better right. and more Absolutely. compact and that's just, yep. it seems like that's really opened up the space here. I, yep. I, I think what's happened is that we have innovation on many, many fronts. We've got technologies that have large economies of scale. So the cell phone technology, I mean, it's huge. It's a gigantic, everyone here has got the power of a Cray supercomputer in their pocket. Maybe they have two of them today. And uh, the issue is, can I fly that in space? We have deep learning technologies that are being developed for a wide variety of disciplines and those technologies are being applied to the space sector. Mm -hmm. So for all the technologists that are in the audience, I say, have you thought about space? Have you thought about what your technology can do? Uh, before our session, I was talking to a young an entrepreneur that's in the audience about robotics, and he's saying, this is the innovation that we're doing for robotics. And I'm like, oh, you should probably talk to Jennifer here <laughs> about how robotics can be mm -hmm. applied to mm -hmm. the International Space Station, mm -hmm. because in-space manufacturing yeah. is really going to happen mm -hmm. with the integration of both man and machine, exactly. woman and machine. Yep. It's assisted technology that mm -hmm. this technology is a, is a force multiplier mm -hmm. for what you can do in space and low earth orbit. Mm -hmm. did, did, you, did you want to expand on that a little bit? Um, well, we are looking at, at those uh, types of technologies and also looking at ways to augment what we're already you know, look, uh, working on in terms of the space station and in relation to in-space manufacturing or other areas aside from in-space manufacturing. I was actually meeting with an entrepreneur, uh, well, say, Entrepreneur slash medium sized company. They've they've been around for for some time now. But uh, he was uh, showing me some prototypes that they have in terms of robotic arm uh, technologies and and the applications that that could have across the board. Um, I'm also looking at that from a cognitive computing AI perspective and was throwing out some ideas in relation to other conversations and other technologies I've been seeing with you know big companies like IBM or Intel, you know, how can we play a part in bringing those pieces together, potentially, you know, looking at uh, ways to, to integrate, you know, some of those areas too. But um, yeah, I would say, I would say definitely that, that that's something that in my particular area, because I, I, I spearhead our tech dev vertical, um, you know, I want to make sure that we're getting uh, some of the latest and greatest and, uh, and also trying to be ahead of the curve, you know, what's, what's, coming up in the pipeline in terms of R&D to see if we can test that on the space station. And I was also going to mention really quick, because you asked a question, or you were uh, trying to post something earlier about how to get, you know, how to work in space, how could, you know, the audience, how could entrepreneurs um, uh, engage, or how could they start, and also dovetailing on, on what uh, Sean was mentioning. Um, you know, Cases is one example where, you know, you can um, uh, send us solicitations, you can send us prototypes, or uh, project proposals, concepts, uh, attend conferences like this, or meet with other groups that are, you know, working in, in these um, in these areas. I was also going to mention too. There's a lot of uh, grant money out there. You know, I'm seeing a lot of entrepreneurs and, and startups that are getting uh, substantial grants uh, from government agencies and elsewhere, per participating in competitions. Cases hosts a number of, of uh, entrepreneur. Um, What's like a typical small. grant size? Would you say? Ranging any, depending on the type of research or depending on the type of work, but you know there was actually I was mentioning this to uh, forgot his name from NOAA. I was talking about an NSF solicitation on big data. They were actually trying, and it was a pretty broad request uh, in terms of the solicitation. But that was like a twenty million dollar or thirty million dollar 
solicitation. Now, granted, the the, the recipients, I think it was the, the allocation of that was you know roughly between 100k to 300 and something k over the course of a few years. So then, when you break that down, it's not very much, but it's it's something. You know, it's it's some seed money to be able to get something going, and then you get the, the support. You know, from this big uh, government agency, and and participate in something like that. I was just using that yeah. as an example. Grant, but. grant money is money where you don't have to give up equity to get it. Exactly, non-dilutive. <laughs> yes, so, it's you know, out like, there. It's waiting yeah. for you to grab it. And, and <laughs> yes, and because of that, because it's such a sweet deal, there's a lot of competition yeah. for it. Yeah. And those pockets are not as deep as they used to be. But I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's happened. I tell people that space is getting pushed from the federal level yep. down to the state level. Mm -hmm. So the big question is, what are the four most populous states in the union doing? California, Texas, Florida, and New York. And are, you know, are the New York Center for Space Entrepreneurship is kind of an answer to that. But New York itself needs to have a recognized role, much like California, mm -hmm. much like Florida, and much like Texas in this growing mm -hmm. new space mm -hmm. sector. And I believe mm -hmm. Jennifer Agreed. shares that opinion. Yes, on that. absolutely. So if any of you all are interested in participating in that, please let us know. It just, you just remind me of, of uh, one of the politicians' comments. Uh, California will, will launch its own damn satellite. Um. Absolutely, Jerry Brown. <laughs> that, yeah, and it seems like maybe that's the future here, where each well, state has its own like satellite I, network. I, I look at it and say, with space getting pushed from the federal level down to the state level, you've got California that has the largest GDP of the union, mm -hmm. and you've got Florida that has, uh, the, that's, I mean, uh, Vermont, that's number 50. And from everywhere in between, there's always some aspect of space that is, uh, is taking place in those different areas. I was up at MIT giving a talk, and MIT has a GDP, which is sort of comparable uh, to, I believe, like Singapore or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And Singapore wow. has its own space industry. <laughs> but as you rank those GDPs, and it's a factor of 100 between California and Vermont, you can map those to GDPs of countries around the globe. Mm -hmm. And so Singapore is actually saying, what should we be doing in space? The Israeli Google Lunar X Prize mm -hmm. team mm -hmm. is going to build and fly their lander. So what is Israel doing in space? Luxembourg is very interested in the uh, lunar, in the uh, the mining aspect mm -hmm. of solar system mm -hmm. exploration, and so it makes sense for you know, and it's not like, and it's not uh, when I say participation in space, I don't mean oh gee, how can we partner with NASA? How can we do that? I mean, what is it that you individually, as a state, is doing? And so Jerry Brown, when he said we'll launch our own satellites, you're like yes, that's very possible, <laughs> because. A company like Planet Labs, which has this large constellation, that, that they've pulled in about $200 million of investment. There are a lot of entities, and mm -hmm. big Fortune 500 companies mm -hmm. are some of those mm -hmm. that can say, I've got $50, $100 million around, what is it that I want to do mm -hmm. in space? Do I want to build my own constellation? Do I, I do that build versus buy trade-off of, do I want to build it and fly it by myself, or do I want to buy it? from mm -hmm. somebody else. So then th the barrier to entry to space is getting pushed down so low. Fortune 500 companies can participate. Entrepreneurs can participate. Even some of our young audience members can participate in, yeah, I'm pointing at you. And we're talking about your future over yeah. here, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and so I want you guys to be thinking about how can we be part direct participants in space, not sitting around watching other people participate, but how can we build and fly hardware? How can we analyze data that's coming back from all these space missions? Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's the point about the space apps challenge, is yep. taking NASA data, taking existing space data, and getting a wide variety of people to participate mm -hmm. in this program. Did you want to add anything? I, I have another question to ask both of you. But. No, I, I agree with everything he said wholeheartedly. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, Jennifer and I were like traveling around, we run into yes. each other, and we're like in violent <laughs> agreement <circuit>. about everything. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a contentious family. So. Uh, and, you know, what he was saying, I mean, this, th like you're talking about with this particular conference, this is where ideas potentially for new companies are born. And so, yeah, the more that you can participate in events like this and, and network and try to find out what else is out there in terms of other organizations, absolutely. So we, I want to get to this chart here because it's been, it's yes, been so teasing us for a while. Right. Uh, this, this is the look at business, and there are a couple charts here, right? So we'll oh, yeah, yeah. This is, this is one chart that I present because I think, you know, a rising tide raises all boats, and the point about this chart is to say, you are here. There we are at the end of 2016. You can, this is the amount of money that's been involved in venture capital in the U.S. 
So um, the rule is a third of venture capital is in California, a third is around the rest of the country, and a thir another third is around the globe. So this represents, let's say, two-thirds of global uh, venture capital investment. There, of course, you see the big spike, which was the internet bubble. You've, everyone's got a pets.com sock puppet, I think, <laughs> left over from that whole experience. But the numbers that we're seeing in 2014, 2015, and 2016 are high watermarks that we haven't seen since 1999. So as Prince said, party like it's 1999. There's no better time to do a startup than today because the dollars are out there. You can see that uh, the aftermath of the internet bubble is a low point. Also 2008, the economic meltdown that uh, everyone in New York was very, very familiar with. Um, anyone that worked at Lehman Brothers. Um, so, but uh, anyway, but today things are good. So the environment for startups is good. Let's go to the, the next slide here. And um, some of those startups are companies like these. These are the founder of Planet Labs and they've built a uh, very large, this, yeah, and there's Steve Jurvetson in the back who is recognized as a thought leader that met, um, uh, the entrepreneur, the uh, f the founders, when they were flying a rocket at BlackRock, and they said, "Hey, we've got this vision," and that vision was actually Pete Wharton's vision for flying a constellation of small satellites that Pete Wharton, working at DARPA, developed in the uh, mid '90s. And he has a number of articles that say this is what the Air Force should be thinking about. And what's happened is that technology has caught up to Pete Wharton's vision. And the small satellites that you see there, developed by, uh, by Planet, are an example of disruptive technologies flowing into a, uh, a new industry. And uh, this is the founder of Planet Labs. Let's go on. And there's the CubeSat. So this picture is to give you a, an intention of a size. I used to say, oh, it's as big as a bread box. And people are like, what, what's a bread box? <laughs> but it's yeah. like a loaf of bread <laughs> these days, a standard loaf of bread. I mean, your grandmother knew what a bread box yeah. was, but you guys probably know what a loaf of bread is. So, and like La Wonder Bread, not like fancy uh, Whole Foods kind of bread. But let's go to the next slide here. And, and what are those, uh, just real quick, what do those bread, uh, loaves of bread do that are covered on solar that panels is, there? That's a camera. So here we're on video. All you have is an imaging system and an electronic detector on the back end. And each one of those satellites is its own camera and detector and communication system and processor. So it has a, le the front of it opens up Light shines in, it shines on an electronic detector, much like your cell phone, except instead of having a tiny optic on the back end, it actually has a much larger telescopic lens. And then it takes, those, it takes that data and sends it down to the ground. Well, the founders of Planet Labs have been joined by a whole host of other companies, some of which are satellite uh, imaging companies. Some of them are companies like Spire, which are focused on communications, and they're actually doing an interesting measurement, which is GPS occultations, which is I have a satellite in low Earth orbit, and I can measure the signal from GPS satellites that are at a much higher orbit, but I can measure the attenuation of those satellite signals through the Earth's atmosphere. And from that, I can deduce parameters of the Earth's atmosphere. I can deduce the temperature and the pressure and the humidity and a number of others. And so I can get a handle on uh, the Earth's weather systems. And what Spire is doing has been demonstrated by researchers at JPL, but it's never been done at the magnitude that Spire is doing it uh, today. There are other companies that are in that same area, like Planet IQ, and there are a whole host of satellite data companies that are shown here. Um, Aquila Space is now partnered with Astro Digital, and so they are uh, just sent a bunch of s their satellites to Russia uh, to be launched, and uh, there's also activity, acquisition activity, Skybox. <laughs> this is a sort of an old slide where Skybox was on its own, but it was acquired by Google, and now it was actually sold from Google to Planet Labs. So um, <laughs> Black Sky Global, there are companies that are getting funding, and that level of funding is, at, you know, it starts at several millions of dollars and can go up to hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So let's see what we have on the next one here. And uh, anyway, this is just investment. And so we've got a lot of big numbers in 2015 and 2016. Um, but let's go to the next slide, which says where are we in terms of uh, this investment environment for new space. I would say we are very early on. This is analysis that people did about clean tech 
and the clean tech bubble, mm -hmm. and it broke it down into three five-year phases, baseline, bubbling, fumbling, and the gold rush. We are not in the gold rush yet. Right. We are early, mm -hmm. early on. And I you know, the question would be, have we left the baseline phase mm -hmm. and entered the bumbling, fumbling? Yep. Yeah, 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 and I would area. say that we're kind of, <laughs> we're bumbling and fumbling <laughs> right now because a lot more people are entering the space, but it's still mm -hmm. early on. So the train has not left the station. Mm -hmm. It's still an opportunity to think about engaging mm -hmm. in this industry. You definitely don't want to be starting a company in the retrenchment phase, <laughs> which is like, <laughs> been there, done that, no thank you, I don't want to talk to you. Jennifer, where would you put, where would you uh, pin the tail on the donkey here? Where are we? do you think in this I baseline bubble fumbling gold rush retrenchment phase yeah, I, I agree i was that's what i was saying gray area because i think we're we're still in that middle or maybe coming out of the baseline still in the beginning of the bubbling uh, fumbling but um, you know i was just thinking how in some of the companies that you're mentioning or even like with earthcast or some other uh, companies that we've seen i mean uh, and also thinking of um, oh gosh i forgot the name of the the company it's out of mit uh, it's a small uh, propulsion. Axion, yes, Axion, Axion, Axion Systems. So, I mean, that's a company that started out of, you know, a, a small lab at MIT. It was a project, and and now that's developed into, you know, full blown, we're, you know, lots of investments, uh, major investments. I mean, and these are, you know, like you guys can start, you know, I'm, just, I'm using it as an example to say, it, you know, the, the field is open based on right. what Sean was also talking about. And Ax Axion was an example of monies going into technology companies mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. support the industry mm -hmm. as opposed to companies that are vertically integrated. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, this is a very compelling technology. Mm -hmm. We think it's going to disrupt the small satellite industry. So it's attractive to investors. Mm -hmm. And who knows? It could be bought up by SpaceX. It could be bought and up we're, by EarthGas. Exactly. And we're talking about propul propulsion systems that are mini you know miniaturized you know very small so exactly and it's not the only one the axion yep. phase four um, and uh, we work with a company called positron dynamics mm -hmm. which is in that uh, in that space as well so, so technology companies themselves are getting traction so circling back to that original question we asked before how do you how do you break in here it sounds like one of the things you can do is to go to school and perhaps uh, pursue an engineering track or something like that and get into one of these labs and just ask important questions and solutions, uh, come up with solutions to those questions. Is, would that be a, a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Elon Musk I, hit the nail right on the head where he said space looks hard and it's harder than it looks. <laughs> so, and it's definitely an engineering discipline, but um, there was a great talk before here that showed the overlap of three different areas. And engineering, science, and business are three important areas, and mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. this commercial space sector mm -hmm. is the intersection of all three of those. Mm -hmm. When we do a space startup weekend, and you have and you're selling tickets you don't sell tickets all the tickets to scientists and engineers you're like we need some marketing people we need some business people mm -hmm. that are in here when i talk to early stage companies uh, and they're telling me about what their business is i'm like yeah 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 i get it i'm sure you guys are going to pull endless all-nighters to get that technology to work but tell me about your market traction mm -hmm. one of the things we're focused on with the new york center for space entrepreneurship is steve blank's message of engaging with customers. You gotta get out of the lab and engage with mm -hmm, customers mm -hmm. and figure out what is it that customers want and be ready to pivot. You have a whole list of assumptions. Steve Blank will say, your business is based, your startup business is based on a whole list of assumptions and your job is to validate each of those assumptions. And as validating those assumptions, you're mitigating risk and your valuation is going up. Because when an investor looks at your company, they're thinking, <laughs> they're looking at your company and you show up, you got a big R on your chest, which says risk. <laughs> and you wanna show up with a little tiny monogram that says yeah. R. We got, you know, cause we've mitigated the risk of right. customers and there are a whole bunch of, um, I have another slide what I present, which is like from Cubby Brain about how companies fail. And you know, the number of ways you can fail are, you know, fit on you know multiple hands. You mm -hmm. know, my hand ain't Jennifer's hand. <laughs> and all of the hands up here. Yeah, yeah, all the hands up here. And you're like, <laughs> I gotta get all these things right. And the way you get all those things right is by having a great team. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so find find your weakness and then fill that spot with somebody who is good at it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and accelerators help you um, understand what those weaknesses are. Because everyone knows if I sit around in my room 
and just you know pontificate about how great I am and all that kind of stuff. Um, it really takes somebody else to come in and say, have you thought about this? Have you mm -hmm. thought about that? Have you? Mm -hmm. And so working with uh, cases, working mm -hmm. with startup incubators, uh, they help you understand what are the things that you need to be thinking about that you're not thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. do you have any more slides here oh, that yeah, you wanted to show? I think we've got some pretty pictures at this yeah. point. Oh, pretty so pictures. Uh, what, what are we looking at here? This uh -oh, looks I like... I think uh, I know what this might be. <laughs> so, <laughs> Gee, I, I wonder. Um, you, know, you could say it. <laughs> I was, we, were, we were at an event not that long ago. <laughs> oh, am I? It's probably... Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is about the time where I mentioned the big aerospace company that <laughs> said... At a meeting, I don't know. There's a, a conference where it was uh, a big aerospace company and Planet Labs, and the big aerospace company said, "I don't know why you'd want to image the planet on a daily basis," and that could be you don't know. And I think what's going to happen is that as we build this constellation of Earth observations, we're going to get a daily glimpse of the planet that we've never ever had before, mm -hmm. and that management of that data comes from big data technology, comes from AI algorithms, comes from deep learning. And so this is from the view up above of uh, one of the inauguration <laughs> events. And of course, as you know, everyone's like, I had more people show up at my event, this event, you know, all of that's conjecture. But satellite data can help you understand the reality between alternative facts and real facts. Real facts are, this is how many people showed up, and you can come up with algorithms that calculate. How many people do you think that is? And because if you look at that, you're like, I don't know how many people that is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, is that 10,000? Is that a million? Is that 10 million? But you develop algorithms that help you analyze images like this to get answers that are mm -hmm. important. So mm -hmm. let's go to the next one. And uh, whoops, was that, I think it jumped ahead a couple. Or, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, I don't know what happened there. We have a... Uh, um, and so this is another example of, uh, uh, anybody know what this is? Absolutely. So your journey to Mecca. And this, if you wanted to know how many people show up at Mecca, here you go. And what I thought was interesting about this is that here are all these walls that are built around a structure to you know, keep people out. But from the vantage point of the third dimension, we have live in two dimensions here on the surface of the Earth, but from the vantage point of the third dimension, we can get a glimpse inside of things that otherwise we cannot see. And so, yes, this is Mecca, and I don't know what time of year it is, but you can actually see, based on the other analysis, how many people do you have in there. So let's go to our next slide. So um, this, uh, I grabbed this off the internet, and so it's kind of a, a pixelized version, but maybe everyone can guess what this thing is. What do you think it is? I believe it's the Hudson Yards. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, it's a train yard. And so trains, of course, are important for commerce. And so you can go and you can take this satellite image and you can say, how many cars are there today? How many cars were there yesterday? How many cars are there going to be tomorrow? So that you can do not just an assessment of how busy the train yard is, but make some other assessment about what are the economic uh, parameters associated with th this train yard. How much cargo is coming in and out and where is it going? Mm -hmm. So let's do the next one, mm -hmm. which is a deep dive. And this one, I like this, this is mm -hmm. interesting. Again, what, what payload do people think this might be? Right, so here you are in a car. Coal is the answer, right? Yeah, yes, and the answer is what is coal? <laughs> um, and so here you can actually uh, say if I have a coal burning plant, how much coal is actually coming in to that plant? How much mm -hmm. coal is an economy using? And rather than relying on numbers that are reported by the government, mm -hmm. you can actually do a deep dive into this economy and say, ah, exactly how much coal is actually being burned. Does this have an implication for carbon trading? Does it have an implication for fintech? Let's go to the next slide. So, car And this is a, a great one because another guess is what this might be. Anyone? Anyone in the audience? Guess. Going once. Oil. Is this is an oil field in China. And so the question was, is China stockpiling oil? And uh, SpaceNo is a company that came up with a parameter which is listed on Bloomberg, which says, here's what we think the reservoir of oil is in China. And so China may say, ah, yes, um, this is what we're stockpiling. But actually, 
I think it was Reagan that said, verify, verify, verify. With satellite imaging data, you get a glimpse into what is actually happening in these economies. And so not only is it transparent economies, like the coal-fired plant will say, well, here's how much coal we're burning, but in uh, economies that you do not have transparency, where, and that could be any number of company, countries around the globe, with satellite imaging, you can use algorithms because what happens here is the shadow, those oil tanks have a floating lid. Depending on how much oil they have in them, the lid goes up and down. So you can actually calculate how much oil is in those individual tanks and you can see from picture to picture the shadow cast by the lid, the, the, the edge of the tank is different on the top of the lid. So apparently those are lids that have different oil levels. And sort, so sort of like pushing in a doorbell or something. Right. Where you're depressing yeah. them. You press it in and you can, s and so, but that, c that doesn't come, I mean, that doesn't come from this image. That comes from my saying, hey, do you notice the shadows are different on that? And then how do I calculate that? And I could do it by eye. I could take my young students over here and say, look, I want you guys to calculate the height of those shadows and you know, just do it from the image and you know, with a ruler or something. But I could also, if these kids are smart like I think they are, they could say, oh, let me put that into a machine learning algorithm and then it, the machine itself will calculate all that and then turn out a number in the end. So, and let's go to it, let's see what our last slide is on this. Oh, and another example of that. And this, I thought this was... A bridge to nowhere. A bridge, <laughs> a bridge to nowhere, but it's, it's, it talks about construction. And so, in economies where they're saying, we're spending this amount of money on infrastructure development, you can say, you can take what they actually say on what they're spending on infrastructure development versus what you actually see in terms of infrastructure development. And of course, you can also use it to gauge the expansion of cities in individual locations around the globe based on the development, highway development, based on urban lights and so forth. And I think I've got one slide at the end just to wrap this thing up of just a plug for all the different opportunities there are to uh, engage in this new space sector. And you know what you'll find there is um, you know, a, a, lot of company, a lot of entities, Houston, Massachusetts, but I would like to say here for a New York Space Challenge, a New York Space App Challenge, what's important is that New York itself as a state get engaged in this new space industry. Satellite imaging is a great way to get started, but there are a lot of other things that involve CASIS, that involve lun lunar programs. So, uh, go ahead. No, go I was just saying Mass Challenge is one of them too. It's one of our competitions, yeah. And uh, so just looking at this, all of these companies and, and, and uh, organizations that are trying to encourage this kind of business environment, I guess what would you say right now are, if you could just boil it down to one or two, maybe three, if it's that easy, what are the missed opportunities right now? Where, where are the spots, you know, in that chart you showed earlier where we're sort of this early phase and then forming the bubble and then we get to this high investment gold rush. Like where are the opportunities right now? Where are, those, where are the, the, the things, where are the places that nobody's really looking but they should be looking? Uh, we're here, I mean, I think low earth orbit, of course, with, with CASIS and all of the opportunities that are provided through the International Space Station. There's a huge tidal wave of data that's coming in the next couple of years from companies like Planet, from companies like Earthcast, uh, from companies like Astro Digital. Um, there are also, I was just speaking to a group from South Korea and their satellites, which all their data is publicly available. The Europeans are flying the Sentinel program. And uh, I believe there are uh, lots of opportunities to engage, not necessarily with new markets, but with established markets. And to look at what is it that this satellite imaging data is telling us about our own planet and about our own markets. So, so maybe, I guess, um, Maybe if there, if you can think of a way to use, so imagine, I guess part of this is about imagining all the data that's coming our way and then thinking, what can I do with that and coming up with solutions to there's sort of sell a company. Like maybe there's something that Starbucks could use and right. satellite data and you're the person that thinks of it. There's, there's data fusion. I mean, there's, there's, there's the raw data, there's the calibration of the data, there's the data analysis, and then there's kind of data fusion. And data fusion is the integration of, let's say, satellite data with other market data that's out there, and maybe exactly. social exactly networking. Exactly what I was data. talking about on, yeah. on my so. presentation is data fusion opportunities, or at least trying to leverage you know, multiple players and, and then integrating other 
uh, aspects as well. So when I was talking about, you know, on the cognitive or AI side, there's, and you're talking about uh, other um, opportunities in terms of algorithms. I mean, companies are coming up, you know, with proprietary or IP just on that alone, licensing that, selling. I mean, there's, so there's so many, there's just a wealth of opportunity, I think, involved. But the fused data sets, absolutely, I was just going to dovetail on what you were saying. Um, agree. It, and at this at this point, I, I, we're getting to this point where we're talking about all this data that's coming in you know, perhaps daily views of the entire Earth. Um, we need to talk about advocacy too. We need to talk about um, opportunities in holding countries and companies and other entities accountable for for what's going on on the ground. It seems like that is also another opportunity space in my mind. Um, you know enforcing laws and, and treaties and, and, and things like that. Do you see any opportunities there? And I guess what are some of the organizations that might be doing that? Like if, if you're a hacker and you want to uh, just maybe not, maybe not go into business, but really try to help the planet or, or you know, um, uh, go after injustices, like what are some of the things that you can do? Where, where are the companies or organizations that you can, can, go, can go to? And, and what physically or, or you know, on your own time, what, what are the, some of the things that you can do to help? And I'm, and I'm talking about things like um, perhaps uh, illegal logging or... I, I, think, I think all of that's coming. And um, there are companies um, that I'm familiar with uh, that are looking at illegal fishing. So you actually, you know, uh, what is it, 75% of the planet is covered by water? I've, I mean... 71%. 71%, yeah, okay. So you have an Earth observing, <laughs> you know. I'm a, I deal order of magnitudes, right? You know, 10, 100, you know. So, but, yeah, 71%. And so that in your Earth observing satellite, um, most of your data is, you know, if you're taking pictures all the time, which com you know, companies don't, but you can look at our oceans and what is happening to our oceans. Illegal fishing is one of those. You can pick up the boats that are there that aren't supposed to be there, um, probably also in terms of, uh, of trafficking. I think one of the big issues of our time is with climate change, the infusion of carbon dioxide into the Earth's oceans because the carbon dioxide is absorbed by, uh, by the oceans heat up and they absorb carbon dioxide. The changing acidification of the oceans, uh, the destruction of coral reefs. And I don't think that a lot of the environmental groups have really globbed on to the availability of the satellite data. And as you say, it's not only just our oceans, but our land masses. Tell me about illegal logging. Tell me about uh, illegal construction projects, anything where this is your eye in the sky and it's a, it's a populist eye in the sky. This is an eye in the sky for everybody. And the, to me, the thing about new space is new space isn't for a select few, but a new space is really an opportunity for everybody to participate in space and not participate as a passive participant, sitting on the couch watching astronauts do whatever they're doing, but to say, I want to do that too and how can I make that happen? CASES has some wonderful education programs that engage students in those efforts. You can find them in suborbital communities. Um, and the big data problem is a great opportunity because there's a very low barrier to entry for people to come in and analyze this data, you know, work with a variety of companies that are either selling their data or making it uh, just free, like the Sentinel program out of out of Europe and address some of the burning issues of our time that people need to be, we need to be activists in space. We need to be activists on the planet. And I think that's what you're seeing over the last couple of years. There are people, you know, if you look at the Occupy Wall Street movement, the Tea Party movement, people are like, I need to get charged up in order to change things. And you'd like to see some organization about how they're actually going to change things. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Jennifer, uh, about you know what Sean said here about mm -hmm. being activists from space. What what can we do? What can uh, what can hackers do? Uh, people who are interested in the subject, how can they get involved and and help? I, w I, I would plug uh, to dovetail a little bit on that. Plug, of course, cases because. Our mission is to leverage the, the space station for the benefit of our planet. So, you know, you guys are all participating in an amazing event this weekend. There's participants around the world that are tackling exactly what you're talking about to try to come up with solutions to, to problems or to come up with new ideas and ways to, uh, to tackle certain problems. And what can come from that 
is what you're describing in terms of you know this um, philanthropic or you know the the activist piece. I've I've seen some concepts that have come out of uh, prior Space Apps conferences over the past uh, few years, and excellent uh, concept or new ideas uh, to approach that. So I would say you know, participate in conferences like this. Cases is also an organization that supports that. Um, there's also activity happening, you know, if you're looking at like the United Nations, the, the UNICEF Innovation Lab, those guys are working on a whole host of, uh, of an amazing um, uh, different uh, data uh, products and different solutions and, and exactly what you're just describing in terms of, you know, looking at ways to engage with uh, students around the world, education, uh, uh, disease, um, uh, you know, looking at particular um, developing uh, communi communities around the world and trying to tap in into, uh, you know, various countries. So they're, they're also very active. So I would say if there's any interest there. Um, Esri is another uh, company that has a m huge philanthropic arm. Um, and that's another uh, satellite um, uh, imaging data a company that's pretty has a pretty big presence around the world. So I'm just trying to think of some other examples where you're asking yeah. other companies or who they can reach out to. But those, that's just at least a sampling, a sampling <laughs> start. Um, so real quick, show of hands in in the physical space here. Uh, uh, who has questions? Does anybody have questions? For okay, great. I'm gonna <laughs> shut up right now, and someone come to this microphone if you guys want to line up there, and we will just start asking questions. And uh, we've got about I think seven, eight minutes left in this chat. So let's start with you. Uh, hi. Uh, and, and get like and get like a fist away from this thing and just talking. To, there you go. Uh, so like you said before, there's uh, satellite imaging in like uh, China and uh, like other places. So that brings like a huge security ri uh, risk. And like uh, you can see other, p uh, other countries, like you can map them out. And for some people, you can strategically mass map out some sort of war strategy unfortunately so um is there any way to like prevent such a like um a way of like mapping out countries to create war yeah absolutely i mean when you file a license to fly your satellite they'll say here's what you can image and here's what you can't image and here's what you can image looking up or down and here's what you can't image looking up or down and so the federal government, the United States, which regulates U.S. company uh, payloads launched from U.S. carriers and from U.S. companies, um, they decide what are the things that we can and cannot image. And fortunately, there are most parts of the globe that we can image. So if you ever go to Google Maps and you're like, hey, I'd like to do a tour of the White House, and you zoom in at the roof of the White House, you'll find out that the roof of the White House is all blanked out. You can't use Google Maps to figure out, okay, where are the gun turrets on the top of the White House or something like that, right? Or if you want to take a stroll through North Korea, you know. <laughs> well, you, uh, and exactly you, what you, I was you, ac you actually can. I have actually taken a stroll <laughs> through Google Maps on North Korea. To a certain, a certain extent, maybe. Or <laughs> yeah, I don't know, you know, however, but, you know, you'd be surprised at yeah. how much of the globe you actually can see. And, and yeah. this, is all, uh, this is all under ITAR, I believe. ITAR regulation? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of regulations. So it, it's really uh, it's a really fun body but, of rules. Yeah. And, and I, I think we're getting the signal to kind of move up to other questions. But yeah, there are, I, I would say there are a lot of things that you can see and very few things that you can't see. Um, yeah, hi. On your topic of opportunity, I was actually thinking about it and how, uh, yeah, as you said, federal to state, state and to Fortune 500 companies, et cetera, et cetera. So I was thinking where money and where vision like occurs, that's where opportunity develops, especially in fields of space. So you need both the money part and you need to have the vision that all companies, entrepreneurs, as you said, Jeff Bezos um, uh, and Elon Musk, et cetera, et cetera. So point is, how do you find people with that vision who don't have the money or how do you get people uh, with the money who don't have the vision. So if you incorporate both of them, then you can create like the perfect match and you can just, you know, change the industry. I work on that a lot, actually. I, I would say by being <laughs> here, you're, do, you're doing some of that, right? <laughs> yeah, because I work so, which by the way, are, are you looking for work or can we hire you? <laughs> I'm an altruist. You're very well-spoken young man. Right yes. <laughs> this, this is a guy that's got vision. Yes. That's you, looking you for money, it. I can I, tell you. Just what you described, I have to explain that to other people that don't, you know, that's so, it's so simple, but anyway. On the commercial innovation side, I was mentioning before that we in, we interact, um, or, sorry, interface with um, Fortune 500 companies every day. And then what I also 
do is I meet with small to medium sized enterprises, entrepreneurs that might not have capital, but they have an incredible technology or some, uh, some concept or some prototype that I know that a Fortune 500 company would be interested in potentially looking at. And so that's exactly what we're trying to figure out is, okay, how do we go about in that process, you know, working with these Fortune 500 companies, working with the small to medium sized enterprises and, and giving them that support along the way to see, you know, how we can make sure that their technology uh, is, is seen to fruition because, you know, as, like I said, sometimes there are examples exactly like that. So just as a note that that's also what our organization can help support. But I don't know if you have any other thoughts on the... Uh, Sydney is standing right next to you there. <laughs> Go talk to Sydney. He'll tell you how, yes. to, uh, how uh, to make it happen locally here. <laughs> so, uh, you, oh, well, is well, there, are you based here? Uh, I'm based in New Jersey, central okay. New Jersey, but um, okay. I just came here for the boot camp of the house. We cover the tri-state area. <laughs> okay. So, so while, uh, we if we could take another question, I saw some other people standing back there. Um, and I would just say uh, to you, networking, just the basic act of showing up and talking to people, exchanging information, you're, you can build networks like Jennifer was just talking about on your own and you can sort of connect all the dots. Um, so we have two minutes left. I'll try to make it quick. Sure. Uh, what really stuck with me was the image of the train yard and the image of the oil fields. And what I took from that was basically holding companies, organizations, um, and even just data accountable in a way. Um, and I was wondering, you know, if I had plans to apply to a sp <coughs> space accelerator like the ones you had on the screen earlier. Um, is that monetizable? It's like, is that something that an accelerator would be interested in taking in a company to try to tackle? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is, uh, we are, I believe there's so much data out there that we, everyone hasn't really thought about how to monetize all of that data. And uh, any company that says, and uh, the Space App Challenge is like, hey, I showed up at the Space App Challenge, I learned about the data, I came up with these models, I understand this is where it's applicable to customers. Help me build my company. An accelerator, an incubator will help you build your company and add all of the other pieces that are required to make a company function. And yeah, you could do that on your own, but hopefully an accelerator is that. It's acceleration. It helps you get through that process faster. Mm -hmm. All right, and this will be the last question. Uh. So a while ago, you showed on the uh, slides uh, a diagram with like a uh, 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 baseline and then a uh, bubbling from when gold rush on. Um, so right now, uh, according to your predictions, we're uh, at the like start of the bubbling, bubbling, fumbling stage. So how f how far do you uh, think uh, the bubbling, fumbling stage will go until we get to the gold mm -hmm. rush? I, you know, it's hard to know what that scale is, but, you know, the thermal time constant for that is probably about five years or so. So, you know, this, this stuff is going to happen, and it's happening now. And as an entrepreneur, your job is to get done what you want to do as quickly as possible. There is no time like the present. So you got to kind of hustle to make that happen. And, you know, right now I've seen the last couple of years we've got more Fortune 500 companies that are showing up, mm -hmm. <laughs> that mm -hmm. are saying, I'm interested in mm -hmm. space. So I'm getting the uh, X sign here. But. Oh, I, I would just add, I just personally, I also see, because you know we operate uh, in low Earth orbit with the space station, but for me to be able to say five, 10 years from now, you know, that we were able to help you know, with this um, expanding economy in low Earth orbit and beyond, you know, that's at least when I think that we're starting to see more examples like Planet, more examples like some of these companies that are able to get to a certain level, um, you know, f however you wanna say in terms of success, not necessarily looking at it from an IPO perspective, but just revenue generating, you know, sustainable businesses and, and across industries, that to me is, you know, to be able to say, you know, we were able to look at not just remote sensing, but manufacturing in space, life sciences in space, you know, we're tackling drug development, uh, product, new product development, R&D on the life sciences, biotech, pharma front, um, materials, physical sciences, and, and other areas as well. The, the more that we see those expanding, that to me is uh, when I think that we're gonna be more into the gold rush-ish <laughs> um, sort of uh, phase, unless if you have a... Space is the economy for the 21st century. Yes, <laughs> that's a great way to end this. Yeah. Thank you. I thank you for joining. If you're digital, uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.